the second life of John Wilkes Booth. I can't seem to get away from this man. When I wrote Ghosts of Maryland, two of my prominent ghost stories featured the escape of John Wilkes Booth after the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Considering the tragic history behind the event, plus the hauntings of the Surratt House and the Samuel Mudd House, especially the Samuel Mudd House, it made sense for me to cover that as well. When I came out to Oklahoma and heard that there was a claim of Booth's death in the state, I was both baffled and intrigued. The following is an account of this fantastic legend. Accomplished actor and Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth was tracked down to a bar near Port Royal, Virginia after having fled from Ford's Theater and remarkably trekking through Maryland and across the Potomac River with a broken leg. He refused to surrender and the barn was set ablaze. Traditional history tells us that Booth was gunned down by Sergeant Boston Corbett through the barn walls minutes later when he still hadn't emerged. However, there is a conspiracy theory that suggests otherwise. A faction of people, including some of John Wilkes Booth's descendants, believed Booth escaped Virginia and the man that was killed at the barn was someone else, possibly James Williard Boyd, a man who somewhat resembled Booth, but had red hair. Did the man who was shot have red hair? Identification of the body at the scene was made by Sergeant Corbett, who fired at the black silhouette inside the barn against orders. There was also a few oddities about the autopsy. Following the death at the barn, there was a delay in moving the body to Alexandria on the tugboat that would later deliver Booth to the ironclad Montauk, which was being repaired in the Washington Navy Yard. Since the body's condition was rapidly deteriorating, an autopsy was ordered to be performed as soon as possible by Surgeon General Joseph K. Barnes. Witnesses were quickly gathered for identification of the corpse. William Crowninshield, the Montauk's acting master, stated he recognized Booth's general appearance, but there was no solid evidence that the two had ever really had known each other. Charles Dawson, a hotel clerk, said he'd known Booth from the initials tattooed on his wrist, but he identified the wrong wrist. Dr. Frederick May, who had removed a tumor from Booth's neck, at first stated that there was no resemblance in the corpse to Booth, but later amended the statement to claim that the scar on the neck was similar to Booth's. No one that was actually personally close to Booth was brought in for this autopsy. Years later, in spring of 1872, lawyer Finnis L. Bates met John St. Helen when St. Helen was supposed to be a witness for the defendant in a case in which a man was being accused of selling tobacco and whiskey without a license out of a store in Glen Rose Mills, Texas. St. Helen, however, did not want to appear before the federal court. The reason was not because he was actually the guilty party in the case and not the accused. Breathing hard and his body under distress, St. Helen began telling Bates, now that I have employed you and paid your retainer fee, you, as my lawyer, will and must keep secret any such matters as I shall confide in you, touching my legal interest and personal safety. The lawyer assured him, and St. Helen continued, I say to you, as my attorney, that my true name is not John St. Helen, as you know me and suppose me to be, and for this reason I cannot afford to go to Tyler before federal court in fear that my true identity be discovered. I ask that you take your client indicted in federal court at Tyler and get him clear of this charge, of which he is certainly not guilty, using your best judgment in his behalf and for my protection. For this service, I will pay your fee in all costs incident to the trial and trip. Finnis Bates agreed to the terms and went to federal court at Tyler without John St. Helen as a witness. An agreement was reached with the court and the defendant paid a fine for the transgression, but used the money from St. Helen to pay for it. Bates and St. Helen had a few more interactions in Glen Rose Mills. Bates interested in the man's eloquence and ability to entertain those around him. By July, however, John St. Helen had moved on 20 miles northeast to Granbury. There are records of a man by the name of John St. Helen performing regularly at Granbury Opera House in the Texas town during the 1870s. Like Booth, he was an accomplished Shakespearean actor. Other physical characteristics were identical between the two such as the deformed right thumb, the mismatched eyebrows, and St. Helen walked with a limp from an old severe leg injury. It's also said that this John St. Helen, who tended bar as his main profession in Granbury, 
would drink himself into a stupor every April 14th, the anniversary of the Lincoln assassination, yet remained sober every other day. Finnis Bates also claimed that St. Helen would periodically return to Glenrose Mills, and when he did, he would entertain Bates in his office with performances of Shakespeare. The opposite was also true when Bates would travel to Granbury. In 1877, John St. Helen took ill and feared he was on his deathbed. Even his physician thought the man was going to die. It was there at Granbury late one night that John St. Helen claimed he was actually John Wilkes Booth. He revealed to those whom he confessed where they could find the Lincoln murder weapon, wrapped in a newspaper clipping about the president's death. However, instead of passing away, St. Helen's condition improved. Shortly after regaining health, he fled the area. A few years later, there was a teacher in a thespian who had arrived in Bandera, Texas, and was similar in description to John Wilkes Booth and John St. Helen. He walked with a limp, spoke with a southern accent, and within three years had fallen in love with the daughter of a local cattle magnate. She accepted his proposal of marriage, and a date was set. One of the bride's family members had been an investigator on the Booth case and hadn't been convinced that Booth was truly dead. The investigator questioned the groom-to-be for a short time, during which the southerner suddenly stated that he was growing a bit ill and went to lie down. In the dead of the night, the teacher from Bandera disappeared into the Texas landscape. Decades passed until the tale picked up again in 1903. A man named David E. George, a poor painter of houses by profession, was living at the boarding house at the Grand Avenue Hotel in Edenid, Oklahoma. Locals claimed he sometimes said, I killed the best man who ever lived. Depressed, George administered poison to himself in the lonely hotel room and for the following few hours screamed in agony as the fatal dose snaked its way into his system. The screams roused the boarding house staff and they rushed into the room to discover what was wrong. George told them what he had done and also gave a deathbed confession that he was really John Wilkes Booth. It was also revealed later that he had given this same confession to Mrs. C.A. Harper, a local preacher's wife, when he grew ill one day a couple years prior. However, he frightened her with threats after he recovered. Found upon his body after he died was a letter addressed to Finnis Bates, who was then living in Memphis, Tennessee. The following day, David George was embalmed and put on display at Kaufman's funeral parlor so that someone from the public could claim him. The locals remarked about the resemblance to John Wilkes Booth, and the doctor who confirmed his death also noted that George had once suffered from a severe broken leg. As the throng of people increased to get a glimpse of this man, crowd leaders drew up that enticed a lot to demand the body be handed over to a lynch mob. Police were brought in to maintain order, and word spread about the rising discontent. Junius B. Booth, nephew of John Wilkes, went to Enid and identified the body as his uncle, but he did not claim it. Upon hearing about the death and description of the man in Enid, Finnis L. Bates traveled to the town and examined the corpse. Bates claimed that the body was that of the man he had once known as John St. Helen, and David George was released to him upon payment of the embalming fee. However, the tale does not stop there. Bates may have befriended John St. Helen, but there was no rest nor funeral nor any burial for the body of David E. George. In 1904, the mummified corpse of the man that resembled and claimed to be John Wilkes Booth was put on display at the St. Louis World's Fair. Bates began writing a book about an alternate history of the man who had shot and killed Abraham Lincoln, and he leased out the body to a number of carnivals that put it on display as a sideshow. Bates' book, The Escape and Suicide of John Wilkes Booth, was published in 1908, and a number of suitors emerged desiring to purchase the mummy of David George. Henry Ford was actually one who expressed some interest, but whether it was to avoid public scrutiny or he truly started disbelieving the Booth legend from Enid, he went through. Bates eventually sold the corpse to a traveling circus where it remained as a sideshow until disappearing to time. Its last appearance was in the mid-1970s and is now believed to be tucked away in a storehouse somewhere, although that is pure speculation. Today, both the Granbury Opera House and the old Grand Avenue Hotel, now Garfield Furniture in Eden, Oklahoma, have reported incidents of paranormal activity. 
during a recent investigation by the television show Ghost Lab. They believe that they captured an EVP in the ambient noise at Granbury of an entity saying, Yes, I am John Wilkes Booth. The room in which David E. George died at Garfield Furniture has been preserved from the day George committed suicide. All that is missing is the door to the room, which is important to note since one of the strange noises the proprietor hears at the old boarding house is that of a door slamming. Those working at the furniture store have felt like someone was looking over their shoulder when nobody was around, and the motion detectors in the basement have been set off without provocation. There are so many mysteries associated with this tale. The obvious one is, did John Wilkes Booth escape and make a life for him in the American Wild West? Were either or both John St. Helen or David E. George really John Wilkes Booth? What happened to the mummified body of David E. George? Can the same spirit haunt two locations at the same time? If John Wilkes Booth really did escape, then who is it that was killed by Sergeant Boston Corbett at, the, at Port Royal, Virginia? Perhaps that answer went to the grave with the eccentric Corbett? A man who had actually castrated himself for having impure sexual thoughts. The final mystery? Is it merely an interesting coincidence that the grave of Sergeant James Boston Corbett is located in Eden, Oklahoma?